Hello, welcome back. In this segment, I'm going to talk about the perfect secrecy of affine cipher. We talked about affine cipher in the previous segments, and I will quickly recall what it is. Um, I recommend you to watch the affine cipher videos first before uh, following the this particular video. Okay. All right. So, what is affine cipher? Very quickly, um, we have a message. Uh, let's say the message is x. How would we encrypt it? We call the encryption function um, e of x by doing a times x a times x plus b in mod n okay all right this is basically the encryption function and uh, the decryption function we also saw that um, let's say the output is y what do, how will we decrypt it the decryption function takes a y and uh, all it does is first get rid of b right and then get rid of a by computing a inverse in mod n, which means a must be relatively prime to n. That's basically the definition of a fine cipher. Okay. Okay, so you have to assume that a GCD of a and n is one, otherwise a fine cipher is not a cipher at all. Okay. A and B are private keys, only the sender and the receiver would know. X is one particular message. What is the value of X? X can be any number between zero and N. Of course, Y will also be a number between zero and N, not including N. All right, that's the definition of a perfect, uh, a fine cipher, okay. And in order to prove this is perfect, uh, perfectly secure, um, I'm going to argue now that we can approach it in multiple steps, okay. Um, first step is uh, to show to you a simple, a Latin square representation of a fine cipher. Okay, so let's get st straight into the um, demo now. Just recall, in order to prove something is perfect secret, all we have to do is uh, we have to convince that the probability of um, suppose some cipher text C is shown. Okay, you uh, C is a cipher text random variable, and uh, you wanted to measure the probability that the message is M given the cipher text is C, is nothing but the probability that the message is M, okay? What is the intuitive meaning of this? Intuitive meaning is that the cipher text leaks no information about the plain text, right? Because after seeing the cipher text, you don't gain any new additional information about the unknown plain text, that, therefore the probabilities are same. That's If that condition is satisfied, then we say um, the cipher is perfectly secure for all messages M. Okay, and for all keys k. Okay, uh, of course, in, um, we have proved that uh, affine cipher is not a per not a perfect cipher uh, in 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 the sense that if we reuse the same key a and b for multiple messages x, then it's not a perfect secret. But I'm going to now assume that every time we call the encryption function a and b is unique. The pair a and b is unique, meaning it's used only once for each um, input message x. Okay. Suppose your message is say um, uh, HOT, how will we encrypt it? Uh, we map H to whatever alphabet values. Let's assume we are working with English alphabet, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, right? A means zero, B means one, um, Z means uh, 25 because you start with zero. So H gets mapped into some number, um, I don't know, some number. O gets mapped into another number and T gets mapped into another number, okay? And then we call the EA of X for each of these numbers. Okay. And then we get a, another number. We decrypt it using Y minus B A inverse mod N. So this is how we, we did. Let's say H happened to map to say, okay, nine or eight. Uh, if start from, and then you have to map it O to something else. Let's consider H first. We take eight. I don't know whether eight is correct, but let's assume eight is correct for a moment. E of eight will be A, a times eight plus B. Okay, A and B are two secret primes only the sender and the receiver would know. Okay, this is the basic definition of um, affine cipher we talked about. Okay, now to show this is a perfect secret, I need to show to you this, this relationship is true. Okay, and now let's start with the simple Latin square representation of affine cipher. I am going to show to you an extremely simple Latin square uh, transformation. Okay, suppose I say, I wrote a little program to, to print this, this uh, square for me. Suppose my N is say uh, three. Okay, so what are the possible values of the message? Message can be either zero or one or two, right? That's so the message space is zero, one or two. And the, of course, the possible values of A and B uh, are shown here, but two, uh, you, as you can see here, A cannot be zero because if A is zero, it's not even 
um, a valid cipher, so A cannot be zero. So A can be one or A can be two. A B can take any value, zero, one, two, okay? But now let's try to increase the value of N to four, okay? In the case of four, A can only take values one and three because two shares factors with four, so A cannot be two, okay? That's the reason I said GCD of A comma N must be one. Let's try to do the same with a five. Okay, with five, it, it's interesting. We can see here with five, we can generate a value one, two, three, four, all possible non-zero values because five is a prime number, okay? In any case, uh, this is just the representation of um, a fine saver in a, as a collection of Latin squares, okay? Latin squares mean that um, if, you, if you take one square, let's say this square, right? Um, what it means is that A is four, B is zero. When, a, when the input X is zero, the output is zero, meaning the ciphertext will be zero. When the, when the input X is one, um, one, the ciphertext will be four. Um, input X is two, ciphertext will be three and so on. So what I have already talked about in, in the discussion of uh, affine cipher earlier is that affine cipher is a one-to-one -one function. Therefore, if you, if, you, um, if you traverse along the row, row along a row, right, meaning, take different values of X. Okay, let me correct myself. Along a column, uh, by trying different values of X, you will see all the values are unique. Like there's no duplicate whatsoever, right? Um, of course, it cannot be a cipher if the values occur again. Otherwise you can't decrypt it in unique fashion. So it must be invertible function. That's the reason all the values are different. As you can see, no two values are same on the same row, okay? Also, another interesting observation is that along the column wise, uh, no two, elements are the same. Uh, that is also the basic property of a fine transformation, okay? You cannot get the same value. Um, once you fix this A value and change the B value, like the way we're doing here, right? I fix A to be four, for example, and change B from zero through four, all the values are different along the um, column for each message, okay? Let's uh, take a simple example now to um, understand this in a much more deeper way. Let's take our, um, n to be three, okay? That's much easier. What are the possible values of the message? Message can be zero or one or two. And the, the possible values of the key are shown here. A can be one, B can be zero, or A can be um, two, B can be zero, one, two. Similarly, B can be zero, one, two, four, when A is one as well. Okay, so this is basically the affine transformation. Uh, complete state space is shown on this uh, table, okay? What is interesting to see, see is that if you start counting the frequency, for example, how many times zero occurs in the table? Um, when I say table, I only mean everything um, uh, here to the right of the, the key, okay? So zero, one, two, as zero ones, two, three, four, five, six times, okay? So we see um, zero occurring six times, well, okay? Uh, we can also even count uh, um, column-wise. Uh, that's that's much more uh, use, useful for me in, in the next part of the discussion. Um, if you take the first column, zero occurs two times. Take the second column, zero also occurs two times. Third column, zero occurs two times, okay? For different messages we are trying. Similarly for one, if you take the message to be zero, one occurs two times, two occurs two times in the first column. You go to now message being one, one occurs two times, two occurs two times. So you can see, um, the number of times a particular um, cipher test occurs um, is, is, is uniform, meaning all of them are the same. You know, zero occurs two times in a column, one occurs two times in a column, two occurs two times in a column. Okay, that's already giving you an indication that if, if, if you are an attacker and you're seeing number, say for example, two, what can you conclude? Um, you, you can't conclude much because two could have come for multiple reasons. Let's say two, two you are observing two, Two could have been because the key was one and one and two, and the message was zero, or the key was two and two, the message is still zero. Okay, um, just seeing the cipher text doesn't tell you much because let me show you why. Um, two can also be because of message one, okay, and uh, it also occurs exactly the same number of times, two times. Um, message could have been two, and uh, the two occurs here as well. So as you can see, by observing the cipher text to be two, you cannot uh, rule out any of the messages. All possible messages are possible. Further, you cannot rule out any of the keys because all keys are possible. All keys give you the value two, right? Um, um, all valid keys, of course. Um, 
the, the, the transformation that that takes you to the value two. Uh, it could have been one and two or two and two. Okay. When when we talk about uh, perfect secrecy, we we, we only compare against uh, the fact that observing the cipher text doesn't give you more information about the uh, plain text. Okay. So if you look at this table, you can see that um, if you observe um, a particular cipher text, all possible messages are possible, and all possible keys are also possible. That's another important thing to, to make it clear. Um, if you see two, two could have been because of this key, one zero, or one one, or one two, two zero, two, uh, two one, two two, because every row has two as well. So uh, we are not able to filter out any of the keys or any of the messages. Therefore, we think this is a perfect secret from into the perspective. Okay. Now we can formalize this and, and prove this correctness. Okay. Let's let's prove this. Okay. Um, when the when n is three, how many Latin squares do we have? We have only two Latin squares. This is one Latin square, and this is another Latin square. Okay. When n is four, how many we have? We still have two. When n is five, we will have uh, four. One, two, three, four. So when n is six, how many Latin squares we have? We have only two. So how do we find how many Latin squares are there? Well, it's interesting because the values of A must be relatively prime to six. Um, that means there are pi of n um, elements, meaning um, um, all elements that are relatively prime to n are valid A's, right? Okay. Um, Pi of n is actually the, the number that measures that Euler's torsion function. You don't need to know about Euler's torsion function at this point, but you, you do get an idea that you know, uh, all prime factors, um, all factors of six are excluded. Okay, two cannot be the value of a, four cannot be the value of a because four and six share the factor two. So we, we see that two and four are not part of the a, a values. Okay, so pi of six is basically just values one. And uh, and uh, five, the only two possible values. So, so to, to summarize, pi of n will tell you the number of um, Latin squares you have. That's an important metric we need for this uh, proof. All right, let's get started with the proof now. So, in order to prove this, I need to um, show to you a couple of steps. First step is I need to show that um, I need to show to you that the probability of some message being m, given that the cipher text is C is nothing but probability of M equal to M. This is what I need to show to you. Okay, this is the goal. All right. Okay, this is the goal of the proof. So let's achieve the goal in multiple steps. Okay. First step is to show to you that uh, probability of um, M equal to M given that the cipher text C equal to C is nothing but probability of um, cipher text is equal to C given that message is equal to M. This is Bayes theorem, okay? I'm just writing the Bayes theorem now, okay? So this into probability of M equal to M by, so I'm doing the division now by probability of C equal to C. This is Bayes theorem, nothing new. We have talked about it earlier, okay. So we know this. So in order to show uh, perfect secrecy, remember we need to show this component is equal to this component, which means it's enough to show this one and this one are equal to each other. If they are equal to each other, they will cancel out so you get this, okay, anyway. So how do we now go about in computing the denominator? Let me compute the denominator, okay. So, you are observing some cipher text. What is the probability that cipher text is, or, or, or put it this way, what is the probability that the cipher text is, is, is a particular number, okay? From zero through uh, n, excluding n. How do we go about in finding it? Uh, from the Latin square, we observed that um, every Latin square, right, has in each column one particular occurrence of that element, okay? And how many columns are there? N columns are there. So there will be N occurrence of the uh, particular value in one Latin square, okay? One Latin square has N occurrence of the particular ciphertext value. How many Latin squares we have? We have uh, pi of N Latin squares, 
right? Okay. And we need to divide this by how many we have. We have total number of ciphertexts in one Latin square is each Latin square is an n by n matrix. So there are n into n uh, elements in one Latin square and we have pi of n Latin squares. Okay, that means we can go ahead and simplify this and say this is nothing but one by n. Okay, so we are done. We found the denominator. The denominator is one by n. Now we focus on the numerator. How do we find the numerator? We find the numerator as follows. We are given a message m. That means we know the column that we are working with. And the question is, we want to find out what is the probability that um, a particular ciphertext occurs given a particular message, okay? Um, all we need to do is just look at this Latin square and, and reason about it. If we fix the column, how many times a particular uh, element occurs on the column, okay? Remember, um, in every column of the Latin square, if you take one particular Latin square, every column has one occurrence of a particular ciphertext, like zero occurs only once in a particular Latin square, okay? And how many Latin squares we have? We have pi of n Latin squares, okay? So we have pi of n times, so there will be pi of n Latin squares, and each Latin square has exactly um, one time. So basically pi of n occurrences, okay, of a particular element. All right, that's, that's clear. And uh, what about uh, the denominator? How many elements are in the denominator? It's nothing but the number of um, rows, okay? A column has many rows, n, n into pi of n rows, okay? which means we get again one by n. Okay, let me explain why I did it by n times pi of n here. We are working with one particular column, right? So if you focus on the first column of the Latin square, uh, for example, then you would know first column has how many Latin squares? We have pi of n Latin squares, right? And uh, how many elements are there? Okay, each Latin square has uh, n rows, okay, therefore, the number of rows is nothing but n times pi of n. That's the best way to, to explain, okay? So we have proved that uh, this factor is equal to this factor because we, get, we see here it's one by n and the one by n. That means we can cancel out uh, these two. So we are left with p of m equal to m. So we proved it now that the affine cipher is a perfect secret system, okay? If you use um, affine cipher, in such a way that each message is encrypted using a unique A and B pair, then it's unbreakable. Doesn't matter how much time an attacker spends, he can't break it, okay? So that's the idea of um, perfect secrecy. It's a very novel idea. All right, let's get back to the summary of the discussion and, and wrap it up. We proved that uh, given a ciphertext, the probability that message is M is same as probability that message is M. This is the, the definition, we proved it, okay? Uh, I want to be, you to be a little bit careful. Affine cipher itself is, is easy to break if you reuse A and B for multiple access, okay? For example, if you use same A and B for H, O, T, then you, uh, I have shown on the other video, you can find A and B from the cipher text. So A and B, remember, are secret primes, uh, secret numbers, need not be primes, but secret numbers, okay? But if you, on the other hand, use a different A and B, say, for example, for H, you use A1, B1, for O, you use A to B2, okay? A to B2 are random numbers selected from zero through N, excluding N. Uh, a has to be relatively prime to N. And A3, B3, now you have three different keys, okay? For each letter. So this letter will use uh, A1, B1 pair. So this letter will use A2, B2 pair. And this letter will use A3, B3 pair, okay? Therefore, you can conclude that this is Perfect secret. We have just proved that um, there is no information leaked um, by observing the ciphertext. The attacker doesn't gain any information about the about the potential keys or the potential messages. Okay, that's all. That's the proof I wanted to show to you. Thank you very much.